Good afternoon, or yeah, is it still afternoon? Yeah, I guess it is now. Good afternoon, <laughs> delegates, and everybody watching live. Uh, happy to be back. We, uh, we, we were pleasantly uh, um, uh, gracious to accept the invitation. We did launch last year at this Tech Field Day Extra, so it's a little bit of a, an anniversary homecoming for us. And we did uh, Tech Field Day at our offices in June. So we're going to do something a little different today. Uh, we told you what we do at the last field day and how we do it. Now we're going to tell you why, you know, the, or the so what. You know, why would you want to own data gravity? Through a series of data confidential, real stories from the files of dataware storage. So with me today, I have uh, a few people in the room. Our co-founder and CEO, Paula Long. Uh, Paula is legendary in the storage business. Uh, Paula um, obviously uh, uh, also comes from the heritage of Equalogic. Uh, myself, CTO Dave Siles for Data Gravity, and then your chief inspector or instigator for the day is going to be Gabe Mance, <laughs> one of our senior solutions architects uh, with Data Gravity. Feel free to tweet at Data Gravity Inc. if you have any questions. Uh, we'll be happy to respond to those. If you're here at the show, stop by booth 1928, come and see us on the show floor. So, why Data Gravity? You know, very briefly, storage has been about five nines, speeds and feeds the last umpteen years since the beginning of storage. Storage needs to evolve though. Storage needs to go from five nines to the five W's. You have to be able to answer who, what, when, where, and why. Right? Reason for that is there is no doubt, I, mean, I can tell you this for a fact, 100% of the customers who have bought Data Gravity have found sensitive data hiding in their environment and inside their virtual machines. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is end users, right? End users, you can't firewall stupid, and they wreak havoc, right? PII, exposure, disgruntled employees leaving. They do things to your data that if you don't have a solution like DataWare Storage, you're never going to understand. So really the secret here, and we're going to walk you through in our Data Confidential series here, is how you can define what you have in your data how you can detect those risks, and how you can defend against that. And obviously the answer, if you haven't been following along, our last couple tech field days is Dataware Storage from Data Gravity. We're the only company in the world still that not only protects your data, holds your data, serves your data, but also looks inside the data, gives you contextual, context-aware storage with the ability to surface that information and back up. And I'm going to turn it over to our CSI Mm -hmm. uh, solutions architect Gabe Mens to really walk you through some real life stories and what we found. Now, I will give you the caveat: we are protecting the uh, not necessarily guilty, but the embarrassed. Uh, so, real life stories would not necessarily exposing the company name of who it is. But uh, I'll turn it over to Gabe. Very good. Uh, a little bit about me: I'm Gabe Mens, senior solutions architect with Data Gravity. Um, we have one metric that Paul is pretty adamant about, and that's happy customers. So I get to deal with customers every week and make them happy. Now they're not always happy about what they find, but they're very happy that they have the ability to find what they found. So quick show of hands, what do you think the most sensitive thing that we found within a customer's environment is? Um, most sensitive thing? Most sensitive thing. <laughs> Patents for new products. Patents, yes, we, we have found those. What's the How, most shocking thing you found? Say, is there anything shocking? Yeah. How about homicide? Picture? How about homicide photos oh, wow. in a public yeah, location? Fine. Wow! All right. So we cater to a, a number of different markets. State and local government, for example, has a lot of data, right? And so what we have with customers is that they will go in and find, through the tool set that we have, a hot, you know, a, a visual of what they have in their data. Wow. Where most people start is actually in the dormant data field. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Anything good? No. <laughs> so they'll go into a dormant data environment, look at the file analytics, look at how many VMs they have, look at how many shares they have, and go in and actually see what's dormant within their environment. So they can look at how much stuff has not been accessed in six months, nine months, or a year, and they're carrying extra risk on that. Many don't have a well-defined retention policy for their data, and if they do, it's usually a best case effort. And this is certainly true in the, what we found with the state and local government sector. In fact, wouldn't it be interesting to find all the data that hasn't been accessed in a year that has credit card numbers within it? I can showcase that now, and I can actually 
Ex export a list and defensively delete that information, right? It's always a challenge to showcase what needs to be removed, what needs to be deleted. We now give you the ability to say, this is information that hasn't been accessed and it contains things that are sensitive. Let's go ahead and possibly do something about that. What we've also introduced, and this is um, in the education uh, sector, people like to store things. And one of the things they like to store are their MP3 and music collections. And they usually store those things on their home drive or share locations. They'll do an iTunes sync, for example. How much money are companies spending in backing up iTunes libraries and replicating that data? Now I can actually go into a search within Data Gravity, create a tag on that same share, find all of that information, actually filter it by file type. So I'm just going to search for video and audio information. And now I have a list of all of that information. I can actually save that as a search. And recently, we just announced that we have the ability to subscribe to that information. So now you'll get an email alert or a syslog event when people sync their favorite version of Justin Bieber or Taylor Swift up onto the uh, centralized storage fabric. The email itself will come and actually showcase for you where that media lives, which virtual machines, which shares. So I can actually go into the share itself, hyperlink, authenticate, and bring back the resultant set. Okay, So media information, um, family vacation information, all of those things might not be sensitive, but they're, at, they're consuming a lot of corporate assets. We can go into the file itself. In fact, since we're in San Francisco, Let's go ahead and take a look and see what they've got. <coughs> Jamming. So a little Grateful Dead, right? Out on the public sand. Leave that on. <laughs> we want to keep going here or you just jam out for a bit? No, anyway, I'll keep going. <laughs> so it turns out the legal industry uses a, a software uh, file sync and share capability called Dropbox. Dropbox is all over the place in the uh, legal sector, and it's certainly in where our customers are as well. So now we can actually go forward, find all the Dropbox content, who's syncing that information into their virtual machines. I'm going to pull up the display here. And then what kind of information is being stored in Dropbox? Do I have anything that's potentially sensitive there? I can go in, I can find that, I can use the facets to go forward and show that I've got a, a credit card number being synced inside my Dropbox location, and in clear text I have American Express and Visa information in Dropbox, which is being synced into my environment. Turns out the entertainment industry likes to save things with passwords in them. <laughs> so let's go ahead and find all the password files out on the home share. This one's called accounts.xlsx. Excel is the best password repository in the world. It might be the most frequent. There's clear text passwords inside a spreadsheet for all of my various accounts. Just a question, can you go into password protected <coughs> spreadsheets? So if that Excel spreadsheet was password protected, would you be able to go that deep or would it lock you out? Depends. If it was cell level encryption, we get everything but what's cell level encrypted. If it's encrypted at the file level, we know it's password encrypted, but we won't get the content. The password's doing its job. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. It's a great question. So to add to that, can you add encryption to it if you find it? Or act on it otherwise. Can yeah. I move it and stub it? Or I mean, that's something. obviously yeah. yeah. So today we can allow you to alert, right? You just saw the subscribe subscription option that uh, Gabe showed you. Right. Um, you know, it's a beautiful thing because as soon as you have it, you can get alerted on it. You know, being able to remediate it against that's a great idea. 
Yeah, and that's why I was I was thinking the same thing. I figured we might get to that, but right. being able to automate the uh, I believe there's a tech field day every six months. So. <laughs> <laughs> but what you also see is people want workflows. So what we let you do is export the file list in a quick PowerShell script. You can go ahead and you can change the permissions. You can go ahead and encrypt. You can go ahead and delete. So we have a lot of customers who actually don't want it automated, want a workflow, and they like the fact that they can script and control how that content yeah. changes. Did you say you provide the script that, uh, from the export? We provide the templates for the scripts, oh, nice. so we give you the file list, and then okay. you can go on to, we blog about it, or you can go onto our support site, and you can get the templates for the scripts you can read, feed the file list into. Okay. Is there a REST API interface to get the same data, or? Right now, we aren't publishing that, because once we publish it, it's fixed, but you'll see a REST, like, tech field days come every six months, so you'll, yep. there is one, but we're not publishing it yet. <laughs> That's cool. If you guys look at the product and you go back and watch the Tech Field Day videos, there is stuff in this product that came from Tech Field Day. Yeah. Yeah. So We're not paying that. Stephen a royalty, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> so patient data in healthcare. We uh, do an okay job in, in most healthcare areas of protecting patient information. It lives in structured databases a lot of the times. But what we found with customers is that they export things out of structured databases. They export things into PDFs in Excel. They, ex they export things into virtual machines they don't even know that, that, they're, that they're doing. So we actually now, in this version of the product, allow our customers to define their own tags of what is interesting to them. The healthcare vertical believes patient IDs are interesting to them. So now I can go in and seek and showcase that I've got 23 records that have patient information in them and they're on the public and then they're on the public share so why is that a big deal if I get called into an inf incident response situation I'm asked how many people have access to view that file well prop maybe the whole company but definitively I can showcase to you now that only three people saw that file and read it Wow. Okay. So the people who actually can see it is large, but the actual risk and the threat vector is relatively small. And how far on the history can you go back on that? It's all definable. Okay. It's all based on the retention policy of okay. the customer. Okay. Now, does that include if I'm peering into a VMDK? Absolutely right. Okay. So what about access as well? Yes. The voodoo that we do do is really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This helps folks in those incident response situations understand truly what the risk and threat is. It's no longer a guessing game. We uh, can extend, go ahead. Do you have, um, is there a way to export, say like for PCI compliance or something like HIPAA or yep. be able to, do you have a template already built where I can generate that report and hand over if I need to? Yeah, great. So I came from the retail space, so PCI <laughs> so compliance is a big deal to me. Um, and PCI 3.0 is being released, and there's, it's, it's starting to get, um, it's almost a full-time job just to stay compliant. A lot of QSAs out there right now who are uh, tackling this stuff. But um, great question. In fact, we, we align with a number of the PCI 3.0 um, requirements. And it's interesting you say that, because that's exactly where I was going to segue okay. next. Great. We can go into a search and we can go ahead and look for any types of information that we want in terms of tax. So go ahead and show me all the places that have social security numbers in them. I can search by people. I can search by the tags. And in the PCI world, of course, PAN data, credit card data, and all the pieces that are along with it. Now I can go into an actual file itself. And in this case, I can look at the activity of who is touching that information. That might be interesting because now I see somebody on the list that just put their two weeks notice in. Right? So let me go forward and take a look at all of the activity that that person performed on that VM or in this case the share. I want to see all the pieces that Marion read. I can type all the reads she performed, say, in the past month. Because we all know people who put their two weeks notice in, you should probably go back the last couple months or six months to see what they're actually doing. That's where you find the good stuff. Look at all the stuff Marion read within the last month. 
Can you dig into Microsoft Files Exchange SharePoint SQL Server and get that kind of granular depth for an Exchange mailbox, for example? So, yeah, not today. It's it's on our roadmap. It's on the roadmap. Okay, cool. Because that would be, I'm thinking about a specific client that I have that just had a major issue like this, and they don't know who read what. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's there's PSTs and there's Exchange databases. We, Correct. We're obviously looking at both sides of that equation. Very cool. Yeah. Who can do this? Us? No, but the user. Oh. <laughs> can I give that? Can I, you know, it's role based access? Yeah. Okay. So we have a storage role which allows you to provision mounts and, sure. you know, do those pieces. So yeah. we have an audit role. So an auditor can actually come forward. It's an elevated privilege above the file system permissions. And then we have an end user role. An end user role uh, adheres to all the NTFS file system permissions that are in place. Yeah. So do you guys work with any third party like ID <laughs> management type things or whatever be able to correlate together? You know what I'm saying? We're, yeah, we're, so I we started this. with syslogs forwarding. Okay. So if you're using an upline sim that, sure. that'll take syslog in, you can do event correlation there. Um, you know, we also, it, for this show, we just announced two integration packs with VMware. So we've got the Log Insights uh, content pack, okay. and then we've got the View Realize Management pack. Okay. So if you're doing correlation there, we have it. Um, from an IAM perspective, that's something that's kind of you know down, down the line, like a high trust or something where if yeah, we the, see the, right. a user doing something crazy, we tell them on their API, hey, look, block this user's access. Right, we're not doing that right. today, but it's obviously logically where we're going. Exactly. But we're all about the data aware ecosystem. We're never gonna solve the entire pie, right. but you know we, we sit at Fort Knox, and we can say people are t attacking Fort Knox, go tell the defense layers above us to start blocking stuff. Yeah, because that's where I'm thinking is, you know, if, you, if somebody gives their two-week two notice or whatever, yep. and you start that flow at HR or whatever, yep. that it just kind of moves all the way down into here, if you can start generating and watching, you know, instead of having Absolutely. somebody have to manually go, hey, I need to go in here and add this stuff Absolutely. and start watching. Yeah. Like I said, we, you know, we created dataware storage, we're driving the dataware ecosystem, and you know we are we are all about working with the vendors that surround, even the competition. Who, well, no one really does what we do, but um, you know we expect that people will start doing that. But we really all want to work together because the only way to win this game is understand the data. Yeah. So I come from the Rust Belt, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where we're famous for steel, steam, and bad football teams, right? <laughs> so, but one of the things that's unique about uh, the Rust Belt is that everything's got a part number on it. And occasionally you have problems where things need to be recalled. And so CFO asked me, Gabe, I need to recall a bunch of information. How can I go ahead and find things by part number? We have the ability now with the version of the product to customize and create your own information we call this meta tags, and assign those to where you find those to be interesting. So we have a number of them that ship with the product, but then we also allow you to create your own. So part number would be very interesting. There's not a standard nomenclature for any given um, company, so they can create their own part number scheme for that. And then we can actually search on that information. So instead of searching for I'm going to go over to the other array here. This is where my part numbers are. <coughs> Add on the marketing share. I thought I had it. I apologize, guys. Demo gods are not in my favor today. But you can actually go ahead and look at all those part numbers and then subscribe to an email or a syslog and find where all that information lives. You can actually go forward and define what the new part number should be. So if you're doing a recall, you can get alerted on what the old part numbers were and where the new part numbers are, have already been updated and try to and, and work towards zero on the old part number. And if you go back to our first tech field day, right, the, the, the one question I believe it came from Howard was, it'd be really cool if I could tag on something that's not, you know, well, it's well standard pattern, right? Yep. Came, became a feature in the product. Yeah, it's great, but yeah. there's a lot more information out there that we want to find. Absolutely right. And you could imagine if it was a component that 
lot of people want to be able to find all the products that component touched. We won't talk about the vendor, but if you've got one bad component, it can filter through multiple product lines. So now you can start to find out which products that actually affects. Which by hand is it's admin, difficult. Gabe. That's very interesting. It's admin, Gabe. <laughs> So VMware, we're at VMworld obviously, is a uh, strong partner of ours. So we're integrating, like you said, into the data aware ecosystem. So we've released a content pack for their vRealize log insight and a management pack for their vRealize operation. Cool. Now if I can remember the password, maybe I should go pull up my uh, accounts list. <laughs> is it in Excel? <laughs> it's probably in Excel. Hopefully. Search for it. Content and management pack? Management so while Gabe is getting logged on, we had a question on Twitter. So while Gabe is getting logged on, we had a question on Twitter for performance. Um, data Gravity performs what? as Did well or better than most hybrid storage arrays. Um, um, and we're um, able to do this because of our unique architecture. Are we dug into that in the last tech field day? But basically what we've um, done is taken a dual controller storage array and purposed Good the job. primary controller to do the the heavy lift for the customer data, and uh, what we call the intelligence controller to make sure that you still have HA, but also to do the heavy lift for the analytics. So we're able to get this performance because we're right in the data path, and we're not introducing any additional um, storage latency or IOPS on the disks, and we're not stealing any computes from the primary storage. What are That's your connectivity options for, for data gravity? Um, ISCSI, NFS, fiber channel? Well, we support um, SMB, NVMe, SMB, SMB, uh, NFS, <laughs> iSCSI. He's not even listening. And uh, uh, we're also virtualization aware. So any virtual machine that runs on us, we treat as a first-class manageable object. So, so we, it's got we, its own independent. We stress SMB because we got grief for saying SIFs, but we actually did support SIFs. So, you know, there's more 2003 users than we learn from our mistakes. We are right? 2012. Just say, and even though it retired. <laughs> So obviously Hyper-V is very happy, right? You, you could imagine Hyper-V coming out soon. <laughs> We're at VMworld. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I asked that question about every session two weeks ago. I got beat up. So we're rolling into our management pack for vRealize a lot of the information and we're not talking just about the health of your virtual machines and your hosts and throughput in terms of Q depth and latency and IOPS and all those kind of things that we measure, but there's actually this field in vRealize that's called risk. We think that VMs are at risk only not when they're running out of disk space or underperforming, but also if they have files on them that are risky. So we can actually showcase to you which virtual machines those are, which data stores they live on, and then the breakout of that risk by file type and tag category. We can actually go forward um, and highlight that virtual machine, see what information is played on in the risk. So I've got some highly confidential social security numbers and uh, Canadian SIN numbers. One of the unique things about us is that we can actually then quarantine the VM and take it off the network should you choose. You can quarantine from here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're one of the only companies in the world right now working with VMware shipping actions. So how are you quarantining? Disconnecting the network interface? Disconnecting the network. Okay. Um, <coughs> today it's uh, all, it's VRA, so we actually are published, this is a beta version of our uh, vRealize adapter actions. Um, I think tomorrow we actually are doing a joint session with, with VMware Blue Medora and ourselves talking about actions, but uh, we're one of the launch partners with it. But it just lays the foundation, so as we fire alerts, you're going to see a workflow come up and be able to take remediation. Okay. You know, it kind of goes back to the question you originally asked about, is he a user doing something crazy, can I take some action on him, right? I see it's a public facing web server, it, it gets credit card numbers in it, should never have a credit card number in that virtual machine quarantine it off the network or put it in a Cinderella network, you know, and we're, uh, we've built the foundation to start doing that. That could get pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. So you have risk up here. Can you quantify the risk of a tag right now? I mean, yep. Obviously, so, you know, it is this actually, is more risky than that. It is color coded, so if Gabe was to go back in there, some of them are green because they're informational. Okay. Having IP addresses, 
We show you the count, but not necessarily bad because it's got IP addresses in it. You're gonna have XML files and that kind of stuff. Social security numbers, credit card numbers, that kind of stuff. The presence of those in a virtual machine, any one of them we have a threshold of one. So if we say this virtual machine's in a network policy zone that should never have it, if it has one, it goes red, right? So, so adding back to the, the quarantining part, <clears throat> as part of that workflow, are you, would you be able to say, I'm assuming it, but say I see risky be, uh, activity on that VM, and instead of completely disconnecting it, yeah. kind of isolate it yeah. to continue to watch it and see what's going on, and so then be able to... That was our initial goal for the VRA adapter. We're a little ahead of VMware. Okay. 6.1, if you realize, allows you to take and tie actions to alarms. That connectivity is not in the actual VRealize framework yet. Okay. As soon as it's there, then we'll be able to plumb that through. Okay. Yeah. So this is also very close to anti-malware or any other things that might be risky. Is, is there like, are you working with vendors to like support their engines to? Not necessarily malware, but we are doing some stuff like with Palo Alto, because obviously Palo Alto is a little bit content aware. They have the idea of a user ID. Mm -hmm. um, we all meet in the same framework, and the cool thing is with NSX, if you adopt NSX underneath that, then we all can do some really cool stuff driving through VRA, VRO, the automation, you know, V-realize operations, V-realize orchestration, we can start tying that stuff together. And you know, there's obviously multiple frameworks. We're gonna build beyond just the VMware framework, but VMware is a pretty solid platform to build upon and because we're all man building management packs in the same framework, we can start tying actions together. It really f fulfills that prophecy of the software defined data center. If you listen to VMware's keynotes and stuff, we, you know, we're gluing that together with data awareness from the storage up. That's cool. Awesome, man. So all of the workflows here, I've actually documented on my blog. So a little shameless self-promotion. I know <laughs> us bloggers can all uh, identify with that. So it's mens.net. It's just my last name.net. There's a tech field day tag. All of the particular case studies or file studies that we did, it'll articulate the steps that we got went to get there. The uh, We are at VMworld. So... In the interest of self-promotion, one more time, let's go look for the best party tonight. And we'll go ahead. Best will on some more. And we'll go forward and see what that comes up with. And of course, the demo gods are out here as well. But, um, are you on the right? Oh, here we go. Show all. See, I forgot to check the box. That's what's going on. <laughs> So the best pet VMworld party tonight that you should go to <laughs> is vbrisket.com. This is your personal ticket. Take a picture. We'll see you at the door. <laughs> Another shameless plug. Right? Serious. Serious. <laughs> yeah. <We're> serious. <laughs> Who doesn't like brisket? <laughs> Thank you so much. So have you, have you thought about the prospect of offering this in a virtual appliance versus a storage array because everything we talked about here today is great um but yeah. if i could use it with my existing gear it'd be awesome yeah because yeah, i'm thinking physical like servers you know quarantining and stuff like that yeah. right pcs but, yeah but, just, but once you get your api locked in you'll be able to define that from a networking perspective so like doing the thing. analytics we do is is performance intensive right um, that said, I'm not saying you couldn't go out and build a nice, powerful, virtualized environment to, to do what we do, but we really want to quality control that experience, so that's why we deliver it as a certified hardware platform. At the end of the day, we're software-defined storage on a qualified hardware platform. Um, it's a very valid question. I don't know if, don't know if we want to uh, uh, disclose roadmap. But you have to keep in mind that a lot of the reasons people are not looking at their data is they try they start the scan so they get they they buy the they buy the vision that they can scan their primary data and then every department starts calling IT and wants them dead because performance goes to zero so then they turn off the scan right um, and basically the problem is that you don't have the spindles even if it's SSD so really what they want is they want a way to be able to consistently look at the data without having a performance hit then the second thing they, they talk to you about is you don't want to scan from the beginning all the time because you want to be able to basically just remember what changed. So now you've got something that's like a backup thing trying to figure out what's changed. right? So you've got another person doing change block management trying to map it back to something. So the complexity 
of trying to do this outside the storage array makes it performance, a big performance hit, um, and also adds complication to your virtual environment. And then probably equally important is when you look at this data, and I don't, I don't care who implements it, well, I do, but I think lots of people are going to do it. You need people, content, time, and activities, and you have to marry those together. And time is an important element because you need to go back in time and actually be able to see the content that changed. Knowing there was something there, but not being able to see it and validate it, which is what a lot of these search things do, get you into trouble. So while you know, the data is um, important, I mean, I think Gabe will tell you when he was at uh, um, in retail, every time there was a break in, you want to tell the story? Or yeah, not? absolutely. So I was at a retailer when Target was breached, which was fun. No, it wasn't. <laughs> but um, so we had tools that would do software inspection mining pieces. Um, it ended up becoming a batch process that I ran between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. Why? Because that's when after my West Coast stores closed and before my East Coast stores opened. So if you only have a two hour window to scan through that amount of data and it doesn't make it, guess what? You can't go to the board and say definitively that we don't have any customer data in our environment. Absolutely. You can't. So it has to be real time and it has to be non-performance impacting. Yeah. So and we're, we're very forward thinking when it comes to using our storage. We don't say rip and replace. You'll never hear one of our salespeople come in and say, you have to take everything off of your current storage and put it on data gravity. We really educate the customer saying not all data is created equal and there's certain data, humans, that generate data. You really want their data to be on data gravity or virtual machines that you care about what data that's in them. That should be on data gravity. You know, uh, at the end of the day, we, had, we, we do become a vacuum cleaner because what happens is couple people copy data onto us, whether through our data MRI service, a proof of concept with us, the light bulb goes off the minute they see that first exposure. The next question that gets asked from the person who sits right above them is what other exposure we have? I don't know. Let's copy it into data gravity. So, you know, it, it kind of gets itself and it gets into its own homeostasis, but we never come in and say, you know, take your entire SAP EDI warehouse and put it on data gravity. That's not our space. It's not our, it's, you know, we're relying do you, to you. Do you see, like, you know, the storage <clears throat> admin pushing back on that they don't want to be the guys managing security? Um, you know, and I guess to my That's point is the security team wants that control, right? And so either A, I have to give my security team access into my array, and then, or I have to start doing as a storage admin, just stuff my shooting team wants to do. And so yeah. what I'm getting at here is that, you know, I understand the challenges, right? And and of being able to say, here's an appliance that can go on top of your existing environment. But at the same time, I might have a security team that says, if it's a security tool, storage admin can't be it at all. Well, I got to tell you something. You're a storage guy. Welcome to the security team. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, you know. Unfortunately, that security means. starts at the point of storage. It's where it hasn't been. It's going to get there. We are proving that. Anybody who's been hacked and had data exfiltration, guess where the auditors start? Where the data lived. Mm. Yeah. What's so whether you like it or not, you, worry about you're, you're in like, the security world. From a, mm. from a solutions architect role is if I show a pro, four products to a guy, yeah. And he has to pick between features and functionality. Is he going to want to pick security over time to answer? Security guys love. You know, yeah, but you know what I mean. I'm, you know, I'm getting that. Yeah. We have no compromised storage, so we have a very good storage solution. And what I ask when an IT guy says I'm not responsible for um, security, I say, who do they call when some idiot clicks, including me, on a crypto locker link and you can't get to the data anymore? He said me. Okay. Who do they call when malware came in and basically slashed your data, so you had a murder? They said they say me. Who do they call when they're trying to find out if somebody's done data dumping? The guy said me. I said, so who do they call? And I did like three or four more questions, and I said, congratulations, you've joined the security team, update your resume. Right? You are, IT guys are the, the point of storage, is where data is accessed and where they, so they need to, to blend and work together. And the other thing is, there's a whole zero trust thing going on, but the storage array is like party at my house, right? So zero trust, zero trust, zero trust, open, right? So it's got to participate, and the forward-thinking IT people know that and are, are, are very much engaged. And almost every, we're in the small and medium business, we're not, um, so most of them don't have a big security team. 
and most of them are working together to solve problems. Um, but, and all of them know, if they become a headline, they become unemployed. So the next generation data loss isn't just a smoking hole, which is all our storage guys think about double faulted rate set, or, you know, or a software bug that took everything out. It's kidnapping, murder, theft. It's a mystery, right? It's, it's more of a, it's more than just one thing. And so the storage guys get that data loss means unemployment, right? Or it's a resume generating event, usually in data loss, and that that name and expansion is happening. But also the CIO and the CEO can lose their job over virtual data loss, maybe not so much physical data loss. Paul, you just said something. Us, uh, like one single system. What happens if I have two, three, ten, hundreds of them? Well, you're on, our, Chris the you're on our Christmas card list. <laughs> <laughs> and you no, the problem is all these complex iterations that you have, all the logs, so yeah. how can I collect? So we time? obviously are fettering up the managers and managers today mm -hmm. for security information logs. And then if you look at our interface, it's obviously web-driven, so it's a different tab perspective. You'll see us eventually federate that at our level as well. Um, it's obviously just uh, it's, it's, it's a roadmap item for us, but we are giving you the ability to take and co combine that information through syslog on the back end, which is kind of where our customers wanted us to start. We obviously will get to a point where we'll have a manager in front of, our, in front of all of our boxes. So. Paul, you said something that was interesting when you were talking, and you said the phrase is small and medium business. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like so many storage startups are focused on the Fortune 1 so they can get the big win, and that's what they care about. It sounds like you're in the mid-market. Yep, so we're 50 to 2,000, 5,000 employees, or we could be an apartment in a, in a larger company. Um, and also, you know, it's under a quarter of a petabyte of data is kind of our sweet spot right now. So I'll, I'll tell you an Equalogic story. In the early days of Equalogic, we would walk into a customer, and if they had a heavy storage practice with the guys could tweak out the next five IOPS by tuning, we just left because they didn't <laughs> care about storage automation. So when Data Gravity walks into some place, if they've got hundreds of millions of dollars invested in uh, security practice and they've got a security team of you know 500 people at a log firm, don't laugh, some of them do, or 300 people in a law firm, um, we're, not, we're not there for them. We're there for the guys who, you know, uh, mid-tier mid guys, they have a security practice, but it's not, you know, tens to hundreds of people buying 50 to 60 layered products. We do say maybe you don't want to buy 10 to 12 layered products and stitch them together and we might be able to help you, but that's not our sweet spot and that's not where we go. It's, and it's, there? One of the ways I put this, is when I see smaller and medium businesses, is the same guy's doing the same thing. So when you say, well, let me speak to your security guy, the same guy goes and just comes out with a different shirt. <laughs> right. right. That's true. That's right. And that, this is perfect for somebody like that. Yeah. They're never going to do this without us, right? right? The cost of doing it, just to acquire the pieces to try to do what we're doing in one box, then is, is more than their entire they, they IT budget it. for the year, in most, most perspectives. So. I may have missed this, but do you guys do any sort of, or have the capabilities doing encryption on the VMDKs or anything like that? Is there a re even a reason? level? Or? Yeah, I'm just thinking being able to come at it from a different angle where, yeah. you know, maybe somebody can get around a Windows so I'm not going to pay a royalty, but I think there's a tech field day in six months. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can go on about that, but yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, be able to get around uh, typical. So we obviously are. We are definitely thinking about it. We're doing a little bit different approach to it, and I think people, when they see what we're doing, will absolutely love what we did. Okay. Very cool. I'll stay tuned until six months. All right. It won't take six months though. <laughs> I think what you'll also find as we tell the stories is that people are actually finding valuable information in their data as well. So, you know, people have found, you know, we have an advertising firm that needs to be able to repurpose data quickly. So they've got a campaign that's coming up, something happened um, in the, you know, because social makes people have it to respond quickly. And so what they're able to do is find campaigns that are similar or find the things they've done differently that used to take them days to do, they can do with us in minutes. You know, the other thing we're finding, um, which is extremely important, is people are, able, and Gabe showed it, people are able for the first time to figure out what they can delete. The best dedupe is delete, right? 100%. <laughs> 100%. 
I don't care. And you can't argue the ratios. You can't argue whether this one dedupes better than that or you're aligned right. better than that. And, you know, it only happens for certain file types. You delete it and you defensively delete it, which is important, um, especially from a security perspective, then, then you're clean. And the other thing you, our customers are very excited about is the ability to know who's looking at the data. You'd be surprised how many people will look at the most active user and say they shouldn't even be on the share, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the admin in a law firm doing on a case share? Who's, that's not one of her attorneys. What is she doing there? Well, maybe her friend, well, you don't care, or maybe his friend, but you do care because you've just broken privacy and you've put your company at risk. Absolutely. So, so another, back to the SMB thing. Yeah. So is this more of a, can I use this versus a data store for a hypervisor, unsaid hypervisor? Um, <laughs> can I use it as a file, file server? I mean, yes, is that, I mean, you're opening up for SMB or yeah. or for NFS? S or SMB, like NFS, iSCSI, virtualization aware. Yes, right. we love Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I can use yeah. you as a as a file server. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Pump data and, and yeah, so we're okay. we're running Exchange servers. We're running SQL servers. Okay. We're running file servers. Um, okay. What's interesting? I think he's asking where we natively can provide. No, no file I mean services. she's going around the right. I think it's just starting to click in my so, head, kind so, of the angle yeah. of the whole. Even with um, the structured data, you would be surprised about how much inform interesting information is in the logs. Oh, absolutely. Right? Oh, trust me, I've got nine million ways to go with the syslogs. Yeah, <laughs> so um, just, just the, just the you know, if you go look at a yet. SQL log that's probably never been deleted, right. or you go look at um, some of the other app logs, there's some actually interesting information. You'd also be surprised how much stuff people spew when we've been a syslog source. You'd be surprised how much interesting stuff people put in syslog. Like, we'll never tell you in syslog what content is bad, because part of security, unfortunately, for storage is obfuscation. Yeah. So the last thing you want to do is tell everybody out on the syslog who's ever got access to it that, that file this XYZ has numbers. all the password, <laughs> exactly. passwords in it. You know? right. So an invitation to party at my house, right? Not exactly. just a not just a party I'll at pay my for house. It. Yeah. <laughs> So one, of, one of the interesting cases was uh, service accounts and privileged access accounts, which are meant to do maybe updates or patching or things like that that need elevated privileges. Um, had a customer who actually found service account read activity on the finance and HR share. And that account was being used to update servers. But why is it doing excessive reads on the HR and finance share? Right. Somebody's masking their identity and going after some information. So another thing, one more thing. <laughs> you coming from a retail perspective, is there a use case for having this in uh, in the data center? Absolutely. And, and having an edge on ramp at say like a retail store, like a POS. Absolutely. Having like it's a good it, thing we ship it to you form factor now, right? <laughs> so that, that gets me to my question. Yeah. Um, we haven't really talked nuts and bolts. What are the specs on the device? The amount of storage? Yeah, so we've got three models today. We have an 18 terabyte 2U form factor, all inclusive. Uh, we have a 48 terabyte, which is 6U form factor, and then our large array is 96 terabytes form factor. Dual controller, high availability. Uh, our storage layer, it gives you primary storage. It also gives you that deduplicated archive storage, which is fault isolated, so you get the best of both worlds inside of that, that platform. Our model is very easy. It doesn't require a configurator or a PhD to buy our product, only two SKUs. You choose your capacity, you choose your support. Support, everybody gets 24-7, 365 world-class concierge support. The only difference is whether you want next business day or four hour parts, and that's it. And you know, same thing we did at Equalogic, no array left behind, any feature we come out with, new functionality, cracking PSTs, that kind of stuff. If you're a customer or service and support, you automatically get those new features. Right. Federate them together if you have multiple units in your environment? Yeah, that was a question he was asking. So we, we will build eventually a manager of managers. The nice thing today is we're a web-driven interface, all HTML5. So it obviously works on everything from your laptops, tablets, iPhones. Um, you know, I actually had a customer completely provision a new SIF share from his iPhone while we were sitting at lunch. Um, you know. It was SIFs. It was SIFs. <laughs> what do you guys think the biggest form of data loss is? Anybody know? Stupidity. Human error. What? Human error. Restore from a snapshot. You don't even know what you lost. 
Yeah. Right. So right now what happens is when 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 you get in trouble and you got to go back to a snapshot, nobody mounts two snapshots, diffs and figures out what to get. They don't have time. No. They they roll back to a snapshot. So that's that's basically the largest form of data loss. Anytime <laughs> you roll back to a snapshot, you know, you got the one thing you needed. You don't know what you lost. Right. And that's one of the things by being data aware. We actually know. You might be, might be. Yeah, why don't we wrap up with that? Because I think we're almost out of time. So, but. so the big. So it's sort of funny because, you know, it's not funny. It's kind of sad. But um, you don't even know whose files you just rolled back because you're rolling the whole thing back. Yeah. And so, actually, the biggest Still form the of the data loss is caused by IT. <laughs> and it's caused by a rollback to a snapshot. Just click on the schedule. Yeah. Quick question: Have you thought about having like native listeners on the device, like? HL7 is big in the medical space. Yep. You know, to be able to like input data right onto the device without having another server in front of it. You can, uh, well, you can write directly to us. Right, but, but if it's an application, protocols. I'm talking application level, like if you have a PAX, I mean, if I have yeah, an EMR yeah. system. Yeah, PAC DMR. We haven't, right. we haven't gone that route, but that's an interesting idea. So the cool thing, uh, the cool and scary thing about this product is with storage, there's like six features and you keep making them better. Right. With us, there's thousands of things we could do, and it's going to be figuring out what we should do. But anyway, let's go through the how you're not going to end up um, yeah. being the biggest cause of data loss. So we actually can go ahead and roll up those uh, discovery points based on the retention policy and frequency that you've defined. We know not all data is created equal. So you can go ahead and actually retain and protect this information at various frequencies, including change rate and change volume. So if Microsoft updates come and break an application, there's usually a, a percent change or volume change that's associated with that. We'll protect you from that. Our crypto locker kicks off and it starts encrypting all your files, but it hasn't been four hours since the last backup. We'll take a backup. We create the schedule. We define it on a per share or a per VM or per data store basis. What that allows us to do <coughs> is to do granular restores so you don't have to have the biggest form of data loss. You can actually just go forward, find the piece of information that you need, and restore it with a couple clicks. Now you said the CryptoLocker thing? Yeah. Does it detect that CryptoLocker kicked in? Or was that, or am I like, we do a couple things. One is, said. no, no, we actually, it's a real valid use case. <laughs> yeah. it, uh, it kicks off, we get the rate of change, so it fires the discovery point policy with an audit trail that Gabe started off very early showing you. We find patient zero, right. and then we see every file that patient zero touched, so you know what you have to roll back. Okay. Can but you, you detect that change. Could yeah. you alert on What's encrypted files? Snapshots. Right. So like right. if you, could right. you alert on if a file got encrypted? Uh, we, we, we don't have an alert built in today, but we have the ability to tell you that it's encrypted now and we were able to read it before. So it's, it's, uh, we have the foundation for that. So if you think about that, who, what, where, how, and when. So when you're trying to figure out CryptoLocker, first you have to figure out who the sick patient is, so patient zero, so who's causing it so you can stop it. Yep. You need to figure out how they got there so nobody else clicks on it. You need to figure out when it happened so you can start to contain the time frame. You need who again to figure out what files they touched, right? And we can help you isolate that, get the exact list of files you need to go get to roll it back. Yep. And that restore was Without two clicks, right? Bitcoin. And I realized it was only a couple megs of data, but if that had been a terabyte, it still comes back that fast. We repoint the metadata to our, our intelligence pool. We lazy fill copy behind the scenes, but the end user gets the experience of it being completely back. We had a middle school, blew away a five terabyte virtual machine, repointed the metadata. Recovery is as fast as a reboot. We have zero backup window, no impacts. I don't have to carry a VMware snapshot. We already have change blocks because we're storage, so I don't have to do change block tracking, and we get instant recovery, just natively built into the storage. It'd be interesting to see if you could come up with a way to quota people on number of files that are modifying, so somebody couldn't go out and try to change permissions across yep. well, 50. Just, yeah. and, if that's know. abnormal. Right. That's yeah. That's the thing. Well, we'll baseline it, right? So we'll say right. this is the standard deviation we learn over X amount of time, and then if they do a deviation or variance, and you set your deviation, you want to be able, most people do one sigma, and then fire an alert. Fire if it's two sigma, and just start blocking because they're doing something really stupid. Right. We have we have all the information actually. So we created a data platform. So we created a rich set of data metadata that included people, content, time, and activities, um, and so we can do data transformation. So. We have all the data, now it's a question of how do we represent it. And then we need to make sure we get this stuff right, because if we get noisy, 
people will ignore the information. And if we trigger too quickly, we can make businesses less productive. So we have all of this stuff, and now it's about figuring out the right algorithms to be able to make it a net sum gain. Right? And, and we're close. It's kind of like load balancing. If you look at load balancing, you can find yourself shifting data all over the place because things spike. And most people who load balance find out they can load balance cold data. Hot data is really hard, right? having spent years doing that. So if you do it wrong, though, you make it really bad. You don't make anything better. So we've got all the data, and you'll see us rolling that out. Anyway, Gabe, yeah. want to take it back? Yeah, so we actually will index and catalog on that intelligence pool. So you can. what I'm pulling up here is a discovery point, which allows me to then open the catalog and s definitively tell you the files that changed and which ones were deleted. That's between two snapshots or two discovery points. So never again do you have to roll back and compromise and lose stuff you didn't mean to. Absolutely. Well, we're at the top of our time here. You know, it's been an absolute pleasure to come back again. You know, our anniversary. We, uh, yeah, you know, we, we forgot to eat the wedding cake, but uh, um, uh, stop by our booth if you're here at the show, 1928. If you're not, visit us on our website. And you know, obviously, it's been a great conversation. It's been really nice to be able to share with you some of the stories that we're seeing from the field now that. You know, we've, we've got customers that are using it, and uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the stories. So we've right. got a minute left. If I, can, if I can ask people one thing, it's your data. You should know what's in it. You should gain the upside, protect yourself from the downside. Um, keep, stay tuned to all the crazy laws that are about to come out about how you have to get data privacy. Also, keep in mind that by doing this at the point of storage, and you had to buy storage anyway, you can actually justify it within your existing budgets, and you can justify it by just saving yourself from one incident account, right? So if you can just work one incident, the array pays for itself, and you're buying storage anyway. So I'll let Dave, Dave. I'm actually going to let Steve and Ty up here. All right, cool.